my gavan in folks today we have a very interesting nonlinear partial differential equation that looks a little bit like the one-dimensional navier stokes equation i mean it does have this convection term and this diffusion term but it is missing the pressure gradient as well as the condition for incompressibility and this thing has a name, it's called the Berger's Equation, or maybe Berger's Equation, I'm really not sure how to pronounce the guy's name. But this thing can be used to model things like traffic flow, or even directly solve problems in fluid dynamics, for example, studying the effects of turbulence or shocks. And this thing has an analytic solution, so another useful case study for this in fluid dynamics would be as a sort of playground model of the problem that you can solve analytically and perhaps lead you via some intuitive reasoning to a solution of the actual or more practical case of the problem you're solving. Okay, cool. So how exactly do we approach this thing? Well, immediately notice that if you did not have this nonlinear term, then the resulting structure would just be the heat equation in one variable. So why not take all of the derivative with respect to x terms on one side. So we have partial u over partial t equal to partial square u over partial x squared minus u times partial u over partial x. And this is nice because the other term can be expressed as a derivative. So you have partial square u over partial x squared minus the derivative with respect to x of u squared times one half. In other words, the right-hand side is a partial derivative with respect to t of partial u over partial x minus one-half of u squared. And I'm just going to write this in a more compact manner using partial derivative notation. So I have u sub t equal to partial over partial x u sub x minus one-half of u squared. Now, like I said in the beginning, it would be nice to get rid of the nonlinear term, and we see that u sub x is being subtracted with this nonlinear term. So if I can maybe introduce a transformation, express u in terms of some other function, such that differentiating it would yield a square, then that may be fortunate for us. But what kind of function actually differentiates to a square? Well, this may seem strange, but if you have a quotient rule type structure, because remember that the derivative of f over g is g f prime minus f g prime over g squared, that might help. So although this is going to look like some kind of rabbit out of the hat trick, it really isn't. There is some cool intuitive reasoning behind it. So I'm going to transform u here by writing it as the derivative with respect to x of the logarithm of v, where v here is a function of x and t as well. Well, to be honest, I'm saying that u is proportional to this derivative, but we can deal with proportionality later. Let me show you how this works. So differentiating gives us v sub x over v as u, and if you differentiate this with respect to x, we get v, v sub x squared, as in the second derivative with respect to x, minus v sub x times v sub x over v squared. Okay, cool. So simplifying this a little bit, I have v sub x squared over v, where the v's cancel out, minus v sub x squared over v squared. In other words, v sub x over v, whole thing squared. And if you'll notice what exactly does u look like, then this will imply that u squared equals v sub x over v whole thing squared, which is dope because that means I could have some cancellation, but not in the form I have right now. Because you have this thing minus that thing, you have a negative sign here and a negative sign over there after, you know, plugging it back in. So there is no cancellation yet. But what if I introduced a factor into my transformation. Like I said, right now I'm just saying that u is proportional to the derivative of log v. So I'll introduce a factor of 2, rather wait, minus 2, so that the square remains positive. So we have negative 2 over here, and on squaring we have a factor of 4 that I'll just insert over here. 
and that will cancel out with the one half. So one half u squared would be equal to two times v sub x over v whole thing squared. And of course, that means you have a negative two attached over here. And expanding by negative two yields a plus two times that nonlinear term on the right hand side, which is awesome, which means, which is awesome. Why? Because you have some cancellation. Okay, cool. So that means we have u sub t, which would be the derivative with respect to t of the derivative with respect to x of log of v times negative 2, can't forget about that. And on the right hand side, we have the derivative with respect to x of all of this junk, which is negative 2 v sub x squared over v plus 2 times v sub x over v whole thing squared minus the 1 half over u, the 1 half times u squared, that is, equals 2 times v sub x over v. Again, the whole thing is squared, so you have some lovely cancellation taking place. And then you also have the cancellation of the negative 2s either side of the equation. And that means we have partial over partial t, partial over partial x, log v equal to what exactly? Oh yeah, we have the partial derivative with respect to x of v sub x squared over v. Okay, cool. Now, on the left-hand side, notice that we can switch up the order of the derivative operators. The reason being, of course, we're looking for nice solutions to the physical problem we're dealing with. In other words, a differentiable function. So we can switch up the order of the derivatives and write this as a derivative with respect to x on the right-hand side. And that means we can just integrate with respect to x and that yields partial over partial t log v, which I should simplify by now. That is v sub t over v equal to v sub x squared over v plus some function purely of t, which we can completely ignore. The reason being that we defined u as a partial derivative of v. So u is only related to the spatial derivative of v. And that means after the cancellation of the v's in the, in the denominator, we have v sub t equal to v sub x squared. That is to say a heat equation. Of course, the rest of our solution depends on what boundary conditions are given to us. So let's introduce one just for the fun of it. So let's say that for our differential equation problem, we have u of x zero equal to sine x. So it's this periodic function or sinusoidal function that we're dealing with. And we need to translate this into the v realm now. So recall that u of x and t was defined as negative 2 derivative with respect to x of log of v x t. So that means that u of x and 0, which is just sine x, equals negative 2 derivative with respect to x of log v of x 0. Okay, cool. So the left-hand side being purely a function of x leads us to safely assume that the right-hand side, which contains a derivative with respect to x, should be a total derivative with respect to x. So I can just write this as sine of x equal to negative 2 derivative with respect to x of v of x and 0. And this implies that v of x 0 here is just negative 1 half times the integral of sine x dx. Integrating sine gives us a negative cosine, so v of x zero is, oh wait, terribly, sorry about that, I forgot the logarithm, the star of our show today. So log here and log there. I was thinking something feels off. So this thing equals one half times the cosine of x plus the logarithm of some constant of integration. And this further implies that v of x zero on exponentiation yields c times exp one half of cosine x. Okay, cool. Now, of course, multiplying by some real number does not change the physics of the problem we're dealing with. So we can just ignore c or set it equal to one and say that v of x zero equals e to the one half times cosine x. 
So we've set up this nice looking heat equation problem with this periodic boundary condition and the key word here is periodic because since this function, this boundary condition is periodic and the heat equation itself is invariant under spatial translation, we can just solve this for the interval of length 2 pi, that is x belonging to negative pi to pi, and that will suffice. Okay, cool. So the usual separation of variables thing where we have v equal to a function purely of x times a function purely of t. Differentiating with respect to t yields f of x times g prime of t. And differentiating twice terribly, sorry about that, with respect to x yields f double prime of x times g of t. Substituting back into my differential equation yields f of x times g prime of t equal to f double prime of x times g of t. I'll expand using 1 over f of x times g of t. And that leads to some nice cancellations. So the f's cancel out here, the g's cancel out there. And you have g prime of t over g of t equal to f double prime of x over f of x. Now the left hand side is purely a function of t and the right hand side purely a function of x. Them being equal can only mean one thing, that is both are just equal to the same constant. And you can verify quite easily that for non-negative values of this constant, you get the trivial solution, which is boring, so who cares about that? So we will say that this constant is equal to negative mu squared, where mu is a real number, as in they both equal the same negative constant. So g prime of t over g of t equal to negative mu squared. This just gives you the exponential function. So we have g of t equal to some constant of integration c times e to the negative mu squared times t. And then you have f double prime of x over f of x equal to negative mu squared, which implies that f double prime of x plus mu squared f of x is equal to zero, and this just yields trig functions. So this implies terribly, sorry about that, that f of x is gonna be equal to a times cosine of mu x plus b times the sine of mu x. The cool thing is we can get rid of one of these constants just by recalling how v is defined. So v here of x t is defined as f of x times g of x, g of t that is, so v of x zero is gonna be f of x times g of zero. Now g here is this exponential function, so g of zero is gonna equal one, or that constant c that is. So this implies that v of x zero is gonna be equal to f of x, where I'm just ignoring the multiplication by a constant thing. Okay, cool, or better yet, I could just say that this is proportional to f of x. But v of x zero is in fact this periodic function, e to the one half of cosine x, that is also an even function. So that means we can get rid of the odd function part of f of x. And this implies that f of x is equal to a cosine mu x which is cool, but we still haven't solved the eigenvalue problem in its entirety because we don't have any information about mu. But the fact that the solution we're looking for is periodic, that is to say v of x zero and hence f of x, that means that f of x plus or minus two pi should equal f of x. But wait, if I replace mu x by mu x plus or minus two pi, and if the result is still f of x, then that implies that mu here should be equal to some integer k. Okay, cool. Non-negative integer, that is. So I'm going to say that this is the set of natural numbers, union 0. So this implies that we have f sub k of x because each k defines a different f. And this yields a sub k times cosine of kx. And similarly, g sub k terribly, sorry about that, of t equals c sub k times e to the minus k squared t, which is awesome because that means all we need to do now is get a linear combination of these solutions, and then we have v of x t equal to the sum over the non-negative integers k 
of f sub k times g sub k, which is just the sum over k from 0 to infinity, a sub k times c sub k is just going to be another constant, so I'm just going to absorb them into a sub k. We have e to the minus k squared t times cosine of kx. And I could separate the k equal to 0 term, reason being that e to the 0 is again 1, and cosine of 0 is 1 as well. So this thing equals, terribly sorry about that, this thing equals a naught plus the sum over the positive integers k of a sub k e to the minus k squared t times cosine of k times x. And now, turning back to the boundary condition, v of x zero, this is exp of one half of cosine x, which no surprise, it's an even function, so the Fourier series is gonna be a cosine series. We have the sum over k from one to infinity, a sub k e to the zero is one, cosine of k times x. And of course the orthogonality of cosine functions mean we can determine these coefficients or these constants quite easily. We have a naught here equal to 1 over pi times the integral from 0 to pi of exactly f of x 0, that's exp 1 half times cosine x dx, and for the other a sub n's, that is for n greater than or equal to 1, a sub n is equal to 2 over pi times the integral from 0 to pi of e to the 1 half, or the exp does look cool, exp 1 half of cosine x times the cosine of nx dx. Now we're not quite done yet because these integrals actually define special functions. Specifically, they define the modified Bessel function of the first kind. So i sub n of x, where n is the order of the Bessel function, is defined as 1 over pi times the integral from 0 to pi of e to the x cosine theta, so that's the argument here, times cosine of n theta d theta. So this implies that a naught is actually just i naught evaluated at 1 half, and a sub n, for n being greater than or equal to 1, is twice of i sub n evaluated at 1 half. And all of this leads to v of xt being equal to i naught at 1 half plus the sum over k from 1 to infinity. Uh, 2 can be factored out. We have i sub n at 1 half times e to the negative, oh wait, this is i sub k now, e to the negative k squared t times cosine of kx. So that is v of x and t, but recall that our target function u of x and t was defined as v sub x over v times this factor of negative 2. So this implies that u of x t on differentiating and multiplying by negative 2 yields negative 2 times, let's see, um, it's going to be a negative 4 up top now. So negative 4, I always struggle writing, writing the number 4, the sum over k from 1 to infinity of i sub k at 1 half, that's just a constant, and then we have e sub e to the negative k squared t, that is, and then we have sine of kx with a negative sign that cancels the one outside, and of course we have this extra factor of k because of the chain rule, and in the denominator we just need v as it is, so that is i naught at one half plus twice the sum over k from one to infinity of i sub k at one half times e to the minus k squared t times cosine of k times x, which is one of the wackiest solutions I've ever seen for a differential equation. Well, I've ever presented on the channel, to be honest, because I do love partial differential equations, so this looks aesthetically pleasing, aesthetically pleasing, if you ask me. So this was really cool. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.